So um, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, again, we've been going strong. I keep saying since, uh, since Sunday the 27th, it's now April the 2nd. Uh, we like to call it World Autism Acceptance or Autistic Acceptance Day. And i um, really pleased to be here with um, one of our new partners. I, I'm Karen Tim, uh, who was the founder of the Neurodivergent Affinity Network of Educators. And Jorn um, is the founder of, well, so I feel like there's so many things that you're founder of. You just have your hand in everything, Jorn. And it's been a pleasure to, to meet you and get to know about the Autistic Collaboration Trust. And um, your partnership is so valuable. and. Uh, uh, you just cease to amaze me every time I think that you, you've got one idea really just so amazing and just uh, you, you've got something else coming down the pipe constantly, uh, which is so uh, really, I don't like to use the word inspiring because it almost feels demeaning because we're, we're told that, right? But I feel like within the community, um, you know, you're, you're really uh, quite a, a, a true role model uh, for many of us to, to just continue to persist and keep u utilizing um, the gifts that we have and, and to, to share our, our brilliance. So I thank you so much for that. Um, before we, we get officially started, um, what, I've, what I do is I've been starting our events with a land acknowledgement from an advocacy perspective. Um, so um, because it is a, a nine event, I'd like to start with that and then I will hand it over to you if that's all right. So um, we would like to acknowledge that many indigenous nations from across Turtle Island and across the world have longstanding relationships, both historic and modern with the territories and lands upon which our advocacy and community leadership occur. We would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territories of these nations as the struggle for indigenous rights is deeply connected to all human rights work. When we recognize the systemic and social connections within our work, it is also essential that we refuse to historicize these struggles because doing so ignores the impact of colonial oppression, which persists today. In our advocacy efforts, we are committed to disrupting and dismantling the systems of oppression that have dispossessed indigenous peoples of their lands and denied their rights to self-determination. This work is essential to human rights work across the world. And uh, like I said, it is just such a a real pleasure and honor to be here with you. We've had such an amazing week. And uh, I think this is a great way to, this is actually our final um, uh, live stream and YouTube, um, uh, sorry, and Zoom call. Um, and then we'll be doing a couple of Twitter spaces later as part of the Intersectional Infinity Summit. But your work, and moving us into the future. Um, I, I thought this was such a wonderful way to, to really end, because it's not the end, it's the, it's the beginning really in so many ways. And so it's, um, it's bittersweet because obviously, you know, we're, we're enjoying the week, but uh, just really looking forward to hearing you. So I'm, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy and just absorb. And thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Karen, for this um, wonderful um, introduction. And really, uh, what I'm talking about here is not about um, me. It's about autistic people, autistic collaborations, and the things that we are doing together. And, and there's more and not more of that happening. So the Autistic Collaboration website uh, well, was set up to catalyze collaborations. And, and that's what, what's happening. So uh, it's, it's not one humongous group of people. No, it's, so we want to keep it small. So it's people consolidating around very specific topics and themes, and then um, those people supporting each other and making the impossible possible. I think that's the maybe the overarching theme. So I'm here in Aotearoa and many thanks for your introduction because uh, colonization is, is well uh, alive here as well. And uh, this is exactly uh, what we are uh, fighting against over here as well. Um, I'd like to make this session as interactive as possible, but in order to set the scene, I'd just like to, well, 
introduce a few concepts. So this will take a little while. So bear with me. I hope I'll get through this in less than 40 minutes. And then I'm really keen to engage with uh, all the wonderful autistic people that are turning up to this uh, fantastic event that uh, Karen is, is coordinating here. So let's get started. So <clears throat> um, I've been saying for many years that um, autistic people are the cultural immune system of uh, human societies. And I think that takes some explanation. So um, how do we understand this? So I've been involved uh, with uh, what's, uh, oh, uh, I'm, I've been sort of involved in, well, 20 years ago, I co-founded a small company and this has become a worker-owned cooperative. The operating model that we use, uh, we call that the new dimension model. So, and the formation of worker-owned cooperatives that offers an alternative life path, especially for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people, because it counteracts commodification and it limits the systemic exploitation of neurodivergent people, which is in full swing. Uh, so a new venture is uh, conceived as an inclusive non-hierarchical organization that's operated by neurodivergent people and that provides a safe and nurturing environment for divergent thinking, creativity, exploration, and collaborative niche construction. So you'll notice uh, the, the, the word competition or market doesn't apply there. We're not in a marketplace. Um, in Terry Omari, the, the new adventure concept translates to what you could call new divergent fauna or extended family. Um, and these indigenous languages like Tereo Mari have important words for concepts that have been suppressed by colonialism. So here's some more definitions. So a fauna is an extended family, family group. It's a familiar term of address to a number of people it's the primary economic unit of traditional Maori society. In the modern context, the term is sometimes used to include friends who may not have any kinship ties to other members. So you can see how this relates to you know, any kind of um, collaborative uh, venture that delivers valuable services. It's an economic unit, um, it provides livelihoods. A whanau is much more than the Western notion of a family. It's a deep connection. It's a, bond that you're born into that no one can take away from you. So it's not this fickle concept of atomized families uh, that uh, are fully exposed to the corrosive system that we're part of at the moment. Um, and there are also specific words for autistic ways of being. So in, in Maori, uh, autistic ways of being are called takiwatanga. Takiwatanga literally means in their own space and time. Most artists are not born into healthy autistic families. So we have to co-create our fauna in our own space and time. In many indigenous cultures, children with unique qualities are recognized and given adult mentors with similarly unique qualities and they grow up to fulfill unique roles in their local community, connected to others with unique knowledge and insights, perhaps even in other communities. And if we are embedded in what I call an ecology of care, we can thrive and share the pain and the joy of life. Without the support of an autistic fauna, autistic life feels like life in continuous emergency mode. And I think this is something that all autistic people are familiar with. Um, autists depend on assistance from others in ways that differ from the cultural norm. And unfortunately, that is pathologized in hypernormative societies. However, the many ways in which non-autistic people depend on others is considered normal. And it's these endless chains of trauma that are being caused that, that must be broken. In mainstream society, people don't understand how autistic people support each other, love each other, and care for each other in ways that go far beyond the culturally impaired new normative imagination. Instead of medication to numb the dehumanizing living conditions, usually referred to as industrialized civilization, people need caring and supportive relationships 
They need activities that they genuinely enjoy and purposeful work that they genuinely believe in. And the saying is, everyone, the saying that everyone knows is, it takes a village to raise a child. And the autistic translation of the saying is, for an autistic person, it takes an autistic fan out to feel loved and alive. In this society, people end up getting killed by the bullshit of social competition and toxic relationships. The way of life is something entirely different. It's an ecology of care. And in their hearts, people know it, especially hypersensitive and hypercompassionate autistic people. So I mentioned the ecologies of care. Those who are the most sensitive and traumatized have and have not lost the ability to extend trust. They constitute an enormously rich and diverse repository of insights and hold many of the keys needed for co-creating ecologies of care. So there's nothing wrong with autistic people but there's a lot of wrong with a society that systematically discriminates against all forms of diversity, and especially autistic ways of being that involve non-participation in competitive social games. So we need positive experiences every day, every week, every month, every year, and continuously over 10 years and more, because that's what it takes to recover from abuse and to gain solid ground on top of which we can build further. Um, now let's talk about neurodiversity and autistic traits in particular. So the benefits of these autistic traits like hypersensitivity, hyperfocus, perseverance, lack of interest in social status and inability to maintain hidden agendas, they mostly do not materialize at an individual level, but the benefits materialize at the level of the local social environment that an autistic person is embedded in. So, Hypersensitivity, for example, allows us to perceive details and to recognize patterns that escape non-autistic people, but at the cost of behavior that often clashes with established cultural norms. Hyperfocus and perseverance allows us to develop levels of understanding and domain-specific skills that surpass the abilities of non-autistic people often but at the cost of disregarding other skills that are regarded as basic life skills by the local culture. Lack of interest in social status and lack of inclination or ability even to, to self-promote greatly reduces social distractions and further amplifies the ability to hyper-focus and persevere, but uh, often at the cost of being perceived as non-cooperative, problem problematic and disrespectful of so-called authorities. The inability to maintain hidden agendas enables autistic people to develop and maintain trusted relationships and very effective long-term collaborations. And that's what we're doing. Uh, but this ability is crippled, crippled in psychologically unsafe environments. And it makes, a, makes autistic people dangerous from the perspective of anyone who is seeking to maintain or enhance their social status resulting in the systematic sidelining of autistic people in competitive social environments. So within the bigger picture of cultural evolution, autistic traits have obvious mid and long-term benefits to society, to society. But these benefits are associated with short-term costs for social status-seeking individuals within the local social um, context. And this is really important to understand uh, the marginalization of autistic people. You cannot understand that marginalization if you don't understand these fundamentals. Um, and there are further aspects, uh, or, or to, where does this all come from? I think regardless of whether autistic traits have a genetic basis or are the result of early learning experiences made by autistic children in their local environment, that means we don't play the right way. We are absorbed in our own world. We ignore social status. We show little or no interest in participation in competitive games and so forth. The, the hypersensitivity and pattern recognition of autistic people, they shape the specific experiences and situations that trigger neurochemical rewards in ways that differ significantly from cultural norms. So many of Autistic people therefore avoid copying the behaviors of non-autistic people. Life teaches us that culturally expected behavior 
also often leads to sensory overload. And furthermore, that cultural practices often contain spurious complexity that have nothing to do with the stated goal of the various practices and such that a little independent exploration or experimentation usually reveals simpler, faster, or less energy intensive ways of achieving comparable results. Now, so this create creative approach that we tend to use is in stark contrast to non-autistic people um, who receive significant neurochemical rewards from conforming to cultural expectations, such that they are often incapable of recognizing spurious cultural complexity when they encounter it in so-called best practices. And I think in the education space, uh, many of you will be familiar with these best practices. This is the way things are done around here, right? Um, and we need to look at the, the bigger um, picture, evolutionary picture. So available archeological and anthropological evidence points towards highly egalitarian social norms within human scale, i.e. small scale pre-civilized societies. And such small scale societies, social norms um, against wielding power over others will have allowed the unique talents and domain specific knowledge of autistic people to be recognized as valuable contributions. And a psychologically safe environment at that human scale, so say 150 people or less, the inability to maintain hidden agendas becomes a genuine strength that creates a collaborative advantage for the entire group. In fact, autistic honesty will also have made autistic people prime candidates for maintaining trusted collaborative relationships with other groups. Um, in pre-civilized societies, adversarial encounters with other groups would have been the only situations where the non-autistic human capability to deceive others would have been advantageous for the group. But such situations and costly conflict could easily be minimized by migrating and carving out a new niche in a different ecosystem. Um, and uh, so for the longest stretch of human evolution, yeah, we didn't have these competitive societies. Um, and it's actually this unique human ability to adapt to new contexts powered by new divergent creativity and the development of new tools enabled that's enabled humans to minimize conflicts and to establish a presence in virtually all ecosystems on the planet. And this level of adaptability is the signature trait really of the, the human species. So now let's look at where we are now. These so-called civilized societies are the result of increased human population densities and increased levels of intergroup conflicts. And as the number of small scale human groups increased and as the local resources became scarce, the ability and inclination to outcompete other groups became valuable uh, from an evolutionary perspective. But this capability came at a cost. It's an appreciation of the ability to deceive other groups. So we have to remember that the people who are successful in man maintaining hidden agendas to outcompete other groups, they're exactly the same people who are capable of maintaining hidden agendas within their own social groups. Um, so whilst cultural norms can successfully minimize the immediate or short-term collective cost that comes with granting social powers to competitive and deceptive individuals in the context of intergroup conflict, over the longer term, hierarchical social structures dampen feedback groups and they effectively induce a collective learning disability, replacing cultural adaptability with cultural inertia. I think we are seeing this now all over the planet, and this is that's a very scary development. Social power gradients became a permanent feature once the frequency of external conflicts increased to the point that such conflicts were considered a normal part of the human experience. So it's easy to see that autistic people are continuously at risk of being marginalized within civilized societies in which collaboration mainly refers to negotiating social status and power gradients and competing against each other using culturally defined rules, the so-called market, right? The creative capacity of autistic people 
continues to be relevant in these so-called civilizations, but the resulting capabilities and tools currently tend to be exploited for the purpose of maintaining and strengthening social power grading. So uh, this is the co-opting of the university movement. And we need to push back against this. Thriving autistic communities that act as local centers of autistic culture, they can only come into existence if we can imagine new kinds of collaborations between autistic whānau and the rest of society. And if we allow designs to emerge organically from the collective intelligence that exists amongst intersectionally marginalized people at ground level. Um, the competitive social uh, environments that characterize our modern civilization, they systematically disable autistic people. However, whilst autistic people are usually not interested in social status and are therefore considered socially naive, they're very astute observers. And so we learn to decode competitive social motivations, not intuitively, but intellectually, by a careful analysis of social interactions and behavioral patterns that we observe over longer periods of time. And as children, often we are traumatized by experiences with culturally well-adjusted parents, peers, and the education system. And depending on the extent to which uh, we are prevented from developing our unique interests and our course to comply with social expectations, our trauma may lead us into extreme levels of social isolation or prompt us to seek out some low visibility role within society that minimizes our need to participate in the so-called civilized social game. Whoops. Uh, those who have grown up in a relatively safe environment, say with at least one autistic parent and have been encouraged to let um, our unique cognitive lens shape our interests and activities. We initially retain the courage to explore the world on our own terms, but then we tend to run into major challenges in the social environment at work. Um, so yeah, that's why autistic people tend to be, we tend to be highly concerned about social justice and tend to be the ones who point out toxic in-group competitive behaviors. And it is this quality that has led me to conclude or to describe autistic people as best being understood as the agents of a well-functioning cultural immune system within human society. So we are the ones who, yeah, basically set limits to the ability to which competitive behavior can spread because we're exposing it wherever we find it and often we unfortunately pay a heavy price for that. Um, this would have been obvious in pre-civilized societies but it has become non-obvious in our modern society. So to retain our sanity we constantly work against in-group competition and we often suffer the consequences um, and actually uh, I think uh, this quality is what Steve Silverman has fittingly, fittingly described as the truth dysfunction in non-autistic people. And I think, yeah, it might be worthwhile pointing this out, that we live in a culture that has a truth dysfunction. And we see this everywhere, right? So humans are losing the battle to stop climate change because so-called leaders have taken us down the wrong road. Civilization seems to have reached a dead end. So that's why, yeah, we see plenty of ads for heavy 1.5 to 2 ton electric cars and large numbers of, but that's not going to be the future. We also won't have large numbers of electric airplanes and the future will likely include much less travel and much more electric bikes, velomobiles and trains. So point is, Capitalism systematically favors capital intensive and hence energy intensive investments. And that's slowly but surely, it's killing us all. So there's a huge cultural bias uh, that uh, exists in the social sciences. And therefore the disorders identified by Western psychology, they're simply a reflection of this cultural bias rather than a reflection of human potential. Um, and 
So the level of competitiveness and collective delusion within our civilization that is considered normal, this has led to the existential risks that I just alluded to. And the survival of our species now depends on evolving new collaborative social operating systems that are based on mutual support rather than on social power gradients and a myth of meritocracy. Um, the, uh, an agency at superhuman scale, so you know, groups larger than say 150 people, and so it's these large societies that, that we're part of, that's actually an emergent phenomenon that cannot be attributed to any specific individual. So it's the opposite of this celebrity cult that we see everywhere. So if we want to avoid repeating the mistakes of human civilization, the emergent rules for coordinating at superhuman scale will have to allow for and encourage a rich diversity of human scale organizations. So very small scale organizations. And these small scale organizations, we can think of them as cultural organisms or biocultural organisms. And groups of organisms with compatible operating models can be thought of as a cultural species. And so the human genus basically is the genus that includes all these different cultural species. And we need to encourage diversity there rather than monoculture. And it's obvious in the globalized world, we live in a horrible monoculture. So this brings me back to where we started with your know, ventures. There are concrete example of an emerging cultural species that provides safe and nurturing, nurturing environments for divergent thinking, creativity, exploration, and collaborative niche construction. Um, these new ventures are built on timeless and minimalistic principles for coordinating trusted collaboration and that predate the emergence of civilization. All members uh, share a common commitment to visibly extending trust to people, um, to release the handbrake to collaboration. Um, we unlock the tacit knowledge within the group. That's always an objective. We provide a space for creative freedom. We help repair frayed relationships and we replace fear with courage. And the exciting aspect about the human capacity for culture is that we have created a global digital network for sharing knowledge and misinformation. So that's why we talked about the internet. And it apparently takes things like, you know, uh, of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and a pandemic to put this network to good use. So I think it's, I have the sense that the pandemic has really catalyzed a lot of positive activities in particular, well, it, yeah, beyond the, the autistic uh, communities. And so people are now starting to learn and they're starting to uh, yeah, appreciate some level of autistic honesty, at least in some pockets. And this hopefully allows us to incrementally shift cultural norms away from sharing misinformation towards sharing knowledge. So yeah, I think getting close to the end of the, the slides here. Um, so I'd just like to briefly talk about competition again. Um, in all domains that require specialized skills and deep domain knowledge, some of the best professionals that I've met certainly in terms of their level of experience and problem solving abilities have strong autistic traits. So it's very likely that these people will be misunderstood by their colleagues on a regular basis and they may be perceived as competitive simply because they may not stick to all the social rules of politeness at all times. And, um, and sometimes autistic people are accused of yeah, being, um, well, un uncooperative uh, or arrogant, and where does this come from? I'd like to push back against, uh, well, give, give you some tips as to how to distinguish between an autistic professional and a professional bully. So the autistic professional does not have a hidden agenda. I mean, they may get angry in the moment, but will never hold a grudge or follow a plot to get ahead. The autistic professional is also highly competent in her or his core areas of expertise, uh, and that can then be interpreted as arrogance. And the autistic professional also does not exaggerate or brush inconvenient things under the carpet and will 
openly talk about uncertainties, risks, mistakes made, and that's a good indicator, you know, to clear up any in, in, um, any perception of arrogance. Autistic professionals are also not interested in exerting power over other people, but they'll tend to use direct language, which can be interpreted as authoritarian. And then autistic professionals care um, a lot about and go to great lengths to achieve optimal work results. And this may, again, involve asking for appropriate actions from others in direct language. So it's those traits that we must see as being very positive and not uh, work against. So this is the last slide now, and then we can discuss what's the future of autistic people. Well, I think all hierarchical structures stand in the way of collaboration across cultural and organizational boundaries. And that applies at all levels of scale. Um, in the face of these existential risks that human societies now face, the cultural inertia of civilization will either lead to the extinction of our species, or we will rediscover an interest in genuine collaboration without hidden agendas at small scale, so at human scale. And it's in this latter context that, um, or latter scenario, that artists are uniquely equipped to act as catalysts and translators between different cultures and groups, because we um, have to spend a conscious effort on understanding each individual and we take that time and we're trustworthy because of our inability to maintain hidden agendas. I mean, yeah, we all know autistic people who may try to uh, maintain hidden agendas, but we're just terribly bad at it, right? If it comes to it. And this is what ma marginalizes us and what puts us in a very different life trajectory. So. Now I'm really keen to uh, engage with everyone who's turned up. Thank you. Jorn, that work is, it just resonated so deeply with me. And I remember when I first read it, that part of it in, in parts, because you've got many concepts in there. Um, it just, I, I, I keep it in, in the back of my mind continually because it's a completely different way of seeing things and I, I'm so grateful to you for that. I know um, that there's two questions that I have in my end here and I'm, I'm going to try and chat, um, check the chat um, from the YouTube stream because I do have people messaging um, that are watching that way. So um, I'm, I, I wonder, Maddie, can you, you can't see the chat really from where you are. Maddie is live on location. <laughs> Maddie, do you want to tell us where you are before we <laughs> continue? So that way everybody kind of has a sense of what's going on. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, Karen. Yawn, um, I'm here on location in Newcastle. <laughs> And I'd like to show you, Yon, I've just tuned in and I will be listening back. And honestly, I take such inspiration and the philosophical insight and the discussions we have. So I'm now near the Millennium Bridge and I'll show you that it's been lit up gold. We've been working on this the last few days. So I'm going to turn the camera around if you can see this for the recording. Give me a second. Oh, come on, come on. There we go. So now... This is Newcastle upon Tyne. So for you know the Intersectional Infinity Summit and Autism Acceptance Month, that's me now on location in Newcastle on the banks of the River Tyne. Um, so yeah, I'm just taking it in. Um, how beautiful is that, right? Um, Perfect. Yeah, just having a moment there to appreciate it. I'll turn it round. We're now near the river and um, also the sage. So the, the, that, that, that is the Millennium Bridge that is lit up gold. So the Sage, the kind of art centre, they have the gold infinity as well inside. I, I rang a contact earlier on to put that on their screens. So that's like the kind of main, well, a lot of artistic funding and cultures in there. So we've got like a whole gold backdrop of, um, of Newcastle right now. Um, and yeah, I came down to, to, yeah, share that with you all during this moment and, and, at times it's just us together but the impact we're really having and learning it's it really is making waves literally as i look at the water now and i look at how that flow state of air uh, have you got a comment i feel like we're going to do live interviews with people on the time but but uh but yeah it really is making different waves and connections and yeah i, I guess the 
Karen having the questions, but to Jorn, you know, I, I appreciate you so much and what we're doing and what the groundwork of what you've both done down, you know, the years and learning myself. It's enormously appreciated. But but yeah, it's a lovely moment I'm having right now, just looking on um looking here and and yeah, Newcastle is very much turning gold and turning towards emancipation rather than tokenistic acceptance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and very much, I feel that with you and the ecosystems and learning from that, um, yeah, it's very much appreciated, uh, my friend, to yeah. both of you and everybody watching back on the recordings. I thank you for being here, and yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I think we're at the very beginning of, of a, a huge uh, paradigm shift, and that needs to happen fairly rapidly because um, many autistic people around me, I'm many of us in a ter- are in a terrible state actually right now and so let's not forget that um, and so there's a huge sense of urgency regarding all of this um, so but yeah it's together I think as I said we are the ones who can make the um, impossible possible uh, and in ways that I think um, non-autistic people don't they can't really understand how that works. Um, so, and it's time that, yeah, we are appreciated, not just accepted. Uh, absolutely. I, you know, I was reflecting on this, um, your, this work um, in, in, for different reasons earlier on in our um, Twitter space where, where we were, uh, ironically kind of experimenting with different mo- modalities at the same time because we had a live stream YouTube going and a Zoom meeting and I, I you know we just said let's try it and everybody was like yeah let's try it we opened up a Twitter space so we had all three going um, in the interest of collaborating and getting more ideas and you know so those sort of even a little silly things like that um, I, I think we, we, we do that in so many ways, you know, f- forward thinking, trying new things and not being afraid to, um, uh, it, it's, our, it's ironic because we're told that, well, we have trouble with transitions or we have trouble with this and that, but, <laughs> right? But really when we're, when we're trying to solve problems and be innovative and be creative and, and think globally, um, I, I, I do see so much of that uh, potential and a lot of, I think, the potential gets um, uh, traumatized out of us, right? And so that's why the, the, your first concept, which I loved so much when I read about that, um, can you pronounce it for me again? So, cause I, it's, I know it's a WH, but it's a, it's a, like, it's, oh, the it's, it's, it's not, yeah, the, fan out. So it's, yeah, that, it's that like, it's a traditional, the smallest yeah. economic unit in, in, in Maori society. And it's what you could call an extended family. And the key thing is that it's not limited to kinship relationship, but it's this lifetime, you know, bond that you have. It's, it's, and it's, it's at that right level of scale where people collaborate based on trust. Uh, and uh, at that scale, things happen. We absolutely must focus on this. So we must never get distracted by these absurdly large scale structures and these large scale transformation attempts that people are working on. I, I warn people against that. We need to do things at small scale locally and then between these human scale groups we must collaborate it's like you know we are now collaborating right your group of educators there right and we are coordinating all these uh, wonderful ventures and and so there's a scope for all these human scale groups to focus on a particular niche and we mutually then support each other and the result is something emergent that's completely beyond human control, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the antithesis of what our mainstream ideology teaches us, right? In terms of how to move forward. Uh, We need to trust that everything emerges from the ground up. Absolutely. Now, um, Real Green Horse has joined in and um, had a neat question and it's, it's connected in that it, it's, it's taking us back even further um, and, and has a wondering, 
and I, I don't know if you know, but I was also, I, I certainly didn't go into anthropology as, as you have, but I was an anthropology student and very passionate about um, particularly the archaeological aspects mm. of it. Um, but, um, but in any case, uh, so Real Green Horse has a question um, wondering about Neanderthals. And now this, uh, this word I don't even remember um, back when I studied, that's, I'm aging myself now. So it's Dennis, um, I, I want to say it right. Is it mm. Denisovans? Den say it for me. Mm. Or, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see the, um, the, the word here in the, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Denisovans or. Uh, de yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and somebody else, ah. else is asking too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I've seen these yeah. theories. I've seen these. I mean, I know some autistic people are speculating, uh, you know, endotel genes and, and these, these other um, um, ancestors that we are, we are related to, whether they've got anything to do with autistic traits. Well, my answer is different. Uh, I think the problem that we're facing is simply a hypernormative society. And we've discussed this in, in our other discussion, right? It's when the norms become hypernormative, what happens is you lose people, you, you um, pathologize people, you dehumanize them. Mm -hmm. And the point is this diversity has always been around. We've artificially narrowed the definition of what is proper, what is a proper human. Um, so, and I contend that this level of what we now call new diversity within the human species, this has always been the case. And this level of diversity, we'll find this in, well, we find this in all species, right? And in our own species, we're trying to sort of cram ourselves into a bizarre kind of corner. And so there's, there's no big evolutionary sort of explanation for our particular autistic genes. That's complete, it's an absurd question because um, it comes, well, we've marginalized and are pathologizing specific kinds of people. And this is more a reflection of the pathology in our culture than it says anything about particular qualities. Wow, absolutely. And I've got another, a couple of people are coming in. I'm just um, get, sending an invite here, just bear with me. And um, yeah, so yeah. I see a question from Matty. Shall I just answer that? Oh, I'm sorry. So it's, uh, I think he's asking there, <laughs> how can we keep building a truly, actually autistic community? Um, yeah, I'm, li I'm listening in. There's, there's yeah, Elton so, John in the background, anybody tuning in. So yeah, I'm just keeping my <laughs> oh. eye off. It's uh, quite an emotional moment on the time here. But yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh. For you. Lovely mm -hmm. times, lovely times. So, but I, I actually like to, yeah, talk about, you know, how do we keep building a truly actually autistic community and movement? And the answer is, well, regarding community, we should always talk about plural, autistic communities. This is the important thing that relates it back to this important thing of scale, right? Uh -huh. And it pushes back against any sort of celebrity cult that might otherwise um, emerge. And so just focusing on this small scale uh, is extremely important. And then how do, yeah, and, and then creating these autistic fine out. Uh, I'm having wonderful discussions with people about this. Uh, and it all, I think we can learn from what's been very successful with the autistic collaboration website so far is people gravitate towards specific themes and topics uh, and the design of specific services that they find valuable, that they, where they are compelled to contribute. So it's these groups of compatible autistic people that truly uh, relate deeply to each other. This is an organic process that, where we, that we can catalyze via adopting, yeah, via recognizing how that works and recognizing that we don't like to get together in, in big groups. We, we tend to come together to get things done, to 
to do those things that we care so deeply about that we can't actually go do anything else but do these things. And um, so this is, I think, again, yeah, recognizing that this is how we operate, which is so different from the way that the monoculture, the global monoculture works, right? If we recognize this, then I think uh, the, the movement uh, has a, a real chance here. And the cool thing is that as if we truly appreciate then the diversity that emerges from this, and then we can creatively start collaborating between these services and groups. And I think I, I'm now starting to see this happen and this makes me very hopeful. Um, and what's really important is that we need to, I think collectively what we have to do is to explain this to our allies and to the rest of society, because for them, we have to remember, this is entirely anti-intuitive, right? I mean, for me, this is like, well, first nature, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, uh, it's so obvious, but those things seem to be very non-obvious to non-autistic people. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Real Green Horse has a, a, another interesting question here. Um, so interested in how non-degree holding autistic people are able to contribute to changing the narrative of experts that tell lies about and mischaracterize our place in society. Uh, beautiful. Uh, um, we don't need any um, degree holders. Um, we need to appreciate lived experience. So um, what's, yeah, there's a wonderful um, organization that's uh, come out of the US uh, and it's still fairly small, but it's growing. It's called the Design Justice Network. And mm -hmm. this organization, uh, it's people who are doing some, involved in some kind of design and who, sh but really who are in that space uh, from a social justice perspective. And, and funnily enough, I'm, I'm part of that network and I've discovered that it's like, well, it's, it's full of autistic and neurodivergent people. Surprise, surprise, right? And, um, and I encourage everyone to, to take a look at the um, 10 Design Justice Network principles. Okay, okay. And, and uh, one of these 10 principles is that lived experience is the core design skill that we need. So we need to center lived experience. And that, that, that's, it's a co-creation. I mean, co-design has also been, a, it's a bastardized term, right? Where any sort of uh, tokenistic involvement uh, consultation is used as an excuse to say, yeah, this has been co-designed. No, we need to realize that lived experience, lived autistic experience in this case, that's the design experience, uh, the, 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 the core um, design skill that we need. So we can come up with architectures for autistic communities. This needs to come entirely from autistic people. You don't need a degree for this, right? And the same way that we shouldn't need a diagnosis to be, be, be comfortable in the autistic community. I mean, we know that, you know, so, these things are not ha handed down to us. Uh, we need to uh, yeah, emancipate ourselves and, and free ourselves from, from these tools of oppression that uh, surround us everywhere. And, and by the way, I don't have any, any degrees. So yeah, I studied mathematics, but I'm so allergic to certification rackets that I couldn't bring myself. I, I, no, I don't want that piece of paper. such a, a great point um you're i'm just i'm going i'm going outside the box right now because we've got a space that's starting right now and i'm going to welcome people in via the space because the twitter space is actually um neurodiversity revisited next steps for the real world and i know that people are getting excited and saying wow this is amazing stuff because many have not necessarily heard you um share about you know these theories and ideas and um I think the more we dig into it, the more it will really resonate with, with many of us. Um, every time I hear it I, or read it, I, I feel more closely connected to it. So 
Um, I, I just wanted to let you know that I've got some people listening in through the Twitter space as well. And I just kind of started that quickly. So I haven't even introduced um, what's happening, but they're going to infer. Um, and I saw, um, I saw, let's see here. So those of you that are in Twitter space right now, I actually have um, Jorn Betten here presenting to us via live stream on the Neurodivergent Affinity Network of Educators um, uh, website, or sorry, YouTube channel. And we've got some folks joining us in uh, the Zoom and the live stream, as well as our Twitter space, which is now popping up quickly. This is what happens, right? So um, Real Green Horse asks, design justice, what is it called? Design Justice Network. Just Google Design Justice Network and, and you'll find this. Uh, or DJN yeah. uh, for short. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, and the, and are are they are they linked to uh, the Autistic Collaboration Trust website? Because I know that that. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's one of the organizations that we actually link to, and the other way around. Um, and uh, there's a. Um, Slack channel there uh, on new diverse uh, collaboration, um, and um, yeah, uh, and there's related activities starting to happening to happen there. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I, I would encourage more autistic people to to join that network. It doesn't necessarily uh, cost anything, so um, it's another grassroots uh, movement. Um, and I think it's a wonderful partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, just again, reading the chat, um, so shout out to, to Udit uh, from Maddie. Um, I, Udit, we, we, we've missed you in the Autistics Unmasked space and happy you could join us in the Zoom call today. Uh, you've always got such um, very thoughtful reflections. Uh, so welcome into this new space for us. And Real Green Horse is saying hello as well. Um, and and thank and Udit saying hi back. So it's great. It's neat that we're getting to meet each other in different uh, ways. So this is great. Um, so just to reset the space, um, we have folks coming in through the Twitter space, um, and we also have um, we have several people that are in uh, watching via the uh, YouTube channel for the Neurodivergent Affinity Network of Educators, um, which uh, is putting on the Intersectional Infinity Summit. This is actually the, the last, um, it's actually kind of neat because we've got, you're here, we're talking about the future, we're talking about um, the Light Up Gold, the bridge where Maddie is, Maddie's live on location, um, and he's double dipping right now. He's with you here in the Zoom, and he's also in, I can see him, I can see him there in the uh, space, uh, the Twitter space. So um, the future is autistic is what Kai of Autistics and Masks keeps saying, and uh, that's become a little bit of a, of a theme there. And that's not an elitist approach, right? It's just that I think that it's this um, emancipation that Maddie talks about. Yeah, see the hand went up. It was like I was right there. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, literally, Karen, this is surreal. I've, I'm Like I say, I'm near the quayside now, like chatting live, yeah. watching the bridge going gold and well, come on see. Eileen's on in the background. And uh, yeah, us. shout out to, uh, yeah. Can, can the you let us, and the Irish and, let us and everything. Honestly, this is amazing. I'm just trying to like, <laughs> that, that just shows though, you know, the misconceptions about process and di different pieces of information when we're yeah. coming together like this uh -huh. it's on a scale that people just can't you know can't comprehend and i appreciate uh -huh. you all so yeah di uh, shout out to dexy's midnight runners as well i'll uh, i'll be back in soon but yeah uh -huh. so uh, as people are joining us in the twitter space maddie you got to show a picture so i can at least do alt text while while you're there because you were showing you were showing us before and i think that was before Uda came in can you flip your camera again Oh, he can't even hear me. It's probably so loud. So for those that um, have just joined in, um, we're here with your Jorn Bed, and I feel like we're on a on a news program, Jorn. This is pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> we're just we're just going for gold today. Um, so we we have Jorn Bed in here. Um, I'm a big fan of Jorn's work. Um, Jorn's founder of the Autistic Collaboration Trust, and uh, has been a great partner to the Neurodivergent Affinity Network of Educators. Um, a, a number of us have gotten together just in the last few months, but it's it really is, I love the name of, of, of your organization. And I know like you founded other things, but the Autistic Collaboration Trust really, it, it, we are often seen to be not 
collaborators, not, you know, go off and do our own thing or what have you. But it really truly has been um, magical this week to see relationships, um, you know, just people are so excited to connect with each other. Collaborative ventures are happening. I know you've got a lot of things going on. I know Sarah's doing a, a lot of amazing work. And see, that's our next step is the Sarah's Mosaic Project. All of these people, we didn't even get to, we didn't even get to celebrate about the Mosaic Project because that's where we're going to go next, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be another event where we really kick that off more. Um, okay, so Maddie, uh, we'll take, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Maddie. Maddie, existential artist, alive on location. Please tell us what's going on. on the the that break, break a news. Newcastle upon Tyne is is very much being taken over. The autism is spreading wildly. <laughs> and um, what turns on now? The live broadcast. I've got like a bit of is the Beatles coming on again, Karen? It's like, yeah, what a moment, like honestly. Um just awesome. these connections will will continue on. And thank you to those as well who are here learning for like the first time as, as well, or or continuing to learn. It's it's based upon care and respect for everybody's different views. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful experience. And if everybody has not checked out Art Collab yet, please do get involved. Um, we've got a lot of things coming up as well with autistic um, trauma-based um, mental health awareness and therapy. So yeah. please do check out the website because as many lived experiences as possible are appreciated. And I want to give a shout out as always to those who are self-diagnosed or in the BIPOC community or mm -hmm. women who haven't had the access to that and, and those in marginalised groups um, and the trans community at this time. Mm -hmm. And that will truly shift in the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. And it will continue to happen. No matter what backlash comes, we're only going to build. So I appreciate you all. Um, yeah, and keep coming together, everybody. Beautiful moment right now for me. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you all, everybody coming up. Shout out mm -hmm. to Udit as well. Good to see you, my friends. Mm -hmm. Hope everything's going well in recovery. Great to see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Maddie. Um, I, I feel like we're interrupting what you're doing, but we're not, Yorn. Like we're all, we're all, we're all kind of we're where he is, and we're we're in the dialogue um, that that you just introduced to, to to many many people with with your work and your slides. But this is what it's all about, and um, what a powerful way to be. Um, I, I don't want to say ending. We're not really ending anything. This is really just the beginning. And this has been an, an immersive experience this week. Um, uh, yeah. And so, uh, and, and in our, in the Twitter space, just so you know, so we have, again, Maddie's in two places as am I. Um, we have Lulu here, which is great. Lulu's been with us through the week. Um, Elizabeth, I know you've been in our space before. Welcome. Kai is here from Autistics on Mass, and Kai, I, I know you may not be able to, to uh, speak right now, and that's uh, fine, but so glad that you're here with us for that moment where um, the Millennium Bridge, is it millennial or millennium? Am I saying it wrong? I feel like foolish because it, it like I don't know it personally, but I, I, Millenn I really Millennium like Bridge coming in, yeah, millennium. just to distort the sounds. Hello, I, I, mate, we've got some live people here coming on. Um, celebrating, <laughs> celebrate the vibes. What's it going? Turn around. Wow. Some boys out and about in Newcastle. But yeah, so Millennium Bridge will turn that round. Um, yeah, in Newcastle, just streaming live and uh, uh -huh. yeah, celebrating the month. We'll probably get some live interviews after I might do. But yeah, it's all good. Making, oh my gosh, you're going to do live interviews? That would be so well, awesome. Do, do, do you want to see some music coming in? Wait there, here we go. <laughs> You're in this is part oh, of the this future, is, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, this we, we now we authentic. now have a, have the the artistic <laughs> we have the artistic reporter <laughs> service, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matty, yes. the artistic reporter. Yeah, I'll catch you all soon. Yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. And I know he's been taking pictures. He wants to go hang out and play the the banjo. I think. Um, so let's see who else have we got in our space. We have, oh, Prince X is here too. Oh, this is exciting. Look at it. It's like the whole family's back together. Uh, we've got Real Green Horse and Kai saying again, the future is on top. Oh my gosh, I can't even talk. Autistic. Um, and Real Green Horse was multitasking. So I think you flipped back. I'm doing a live stream. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll turn around. Yeah, yeah that's great. We're and celebrating Autism though, awesome. Acceptance Month. Yeah, from the time. And yeah. Oh my that's awesome. What is that? Oh, it's. Can you hear that, people in the Twitter space? Thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Just doing the live. Thank you. This is hilarious. 
I love it. Okay, let's see who else is here saying hello. Um, uh, Heine, a computational biologist. Lots of cool people coming to the space, whether you're new or seasoned or familiar. Uh, welcome to the family here. Hall is here. Fantastic. Ah, autistic teacher is here. My good friend, Jacqueline. We have Manjeet who is here earlier too. Welcome back. And we have Mandy. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And I'm trying to get down to the bottom. There's so many people here. This is great. Um, I think Charlie was there. Yep, there's Charlie. Welcome back, Charlie. Great to have you. Oh, I got to say it again. No shit, Sherlock <laughs> is here. Um, let's see. And we've got... Uh, Oh, Autism 101, okay. And we have Dragon Daddy 92, some new faces, this is cool. And one more, I'm trying to get to the bottom. I'm trying to get to the bottom, oh my gosh, I can't, can't do it, I can't do it. I'm going, let's see, uh, Lulu, can I make you co-host so you can help me field? Is that okay, or are you, or Kai? I'm not seeing a wave. We're all out of spoons right now, folks. It's okay. If somebody does want what to- What am I, chopped liver? Are you okay to co-host? I just, cause you're in two places right now. Is that okay? I would love that. I can close out of the Zoom and just be their co-host for the uh, for the space. Sure. sure, whatever you like, absolutely. Thank you so much. Real Green Horse, all right. I know Real Green Horse was going to be co-hosting with me later on, so um, this is this is like our extra special co-hosting. Um, okay, so I just want to check check the chat here. Um, we have I got like three chats to to check, and I know there is a question that's coming. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. So we have the Neanderthals question, and I'll be right back. Yes, good. Real Green Horse is in and official there. Thank you very much. Um, this characterizing this was, yep, got that. Come on. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through. I was gonna say, I can also co-host if you need extra help. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna get that last one here, where was it? Um, Okay, so for Real Green Horse, uh, I appreciate hearing about th different things outside of my experience. I'm curious about, oh, keep scrolling down on me, one sec. Hold on, let me close this part up. There, that's better. I'm interested in how non, no, that's the, I, we already got that one, sorry. It keeps scrolling on me, bear with me. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. I appreciate hearing about different things outside of my experience. I'm curious about the future of things in politics. Uh, in politics though, disabled people have been downtrodden the most throughout history. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Jorn? Um, yeah, great uh, and very topical question because obviously uh, we are marginalized and disabled by our society and to a large extent, this is really the, the social model of disability um, applies. And I think in, in politics, uh, hardly anyone knows about the social model of disability. And, it, um, and also coming back to what we were discussing earlier about scale, right? Um, mm -hmm. The way that disabled people tend to be represented in politics at state or, or national levels, tend to be in these disabled people's organizations. And these things usually have a, a scale that is beyond what autistic people are comfortable with. And they have these traditional structures um, where then you end up having a representative, you know, talking about or talking on behalf of thousands of people. And this doesn't go down well with autistic people. And so we have something a challenge there to explain this to, to um, legislators, to politicians that, well, with autistic people, you need to engage a bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. And I, th but we're, I think we're seeing interesting developments. So it's fascinating in, in February this year when, what was it? Around 30 autistic organizations came together to push back um, 
against uh, this Lancet Commission guideline there on autism research, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these are not large autistic organizations, but across the world, right? Uh, we, we do come together uh, in, and, and now there's like a global task force uh, of all these organizations. So we do have things, the organization is just unusual. It's, it's, it's different and in some ways it's more representative and it's more dynamic, right? Within days, we had an international consortium going, right? Across, <laughs> I don't know how yeah. many countries. Uh, yeah. I don't see disabled people, well, or for that matter, you know, in any other domain. I, I don't know whether I've ever seen things move so fast. And, um, and it's, I think via this, these types of things, this, this global task force, we can, uh, maybe carve alternative routes into politics. So here in uh, Aotearoa, um, we're exploring, we're presenting ourselves directly in the disabled people's organization. So that's like the, the umbrella organization of all disabled people. Um, you know, why don't we just go in there um, and we don't pretend to represent all autistic people. We just point, provide pointers to, to autistic communities in the plural. I think getting the plural out there, the diversity out there, and advocating for local local autonomy that we can we have the ability to articulate our needs at a local level and actually get respected and rather than being fed some standard accommodations that are considered to be good enough for all autistic people at a national level, you know that's you we all I don't know. <laughs> If we all get noise cancelling headphones, well, that doesn't do it for us, right? Yeah, that's not enough. That's not exactly leveling the playing field. Well, mm. and that's why I think this is a this is a really great way to, um, like I said, it's not an, it's not an ending. It's just that as we yeah. as we kind of blended into this Twitter space where we are talking about next steps, you know, after after we finish this space. We're, we'll be going into um, uh, poetry and uh, like like whatever space, whatever creative space um, as sort of our conclusion this evening. And so, um, you know, this is such a fitting way to be thinking about um, next steps and bringing yeah. community together. Yeah. Another aspect that I just wanted to weave into this is we need to, mm -hmm. I think by working with the right kind of allies, we can, um, get our voices heard. So uh, the intersectional space is really relevant there because for example, here in, in, in Aotearoa, um, there's no shortage of very marginalized Maori communities and the indigenous uh, culture is very strong. And the, the other, well, professionally, I work a lot with the healthcare sector. So there's this intersection between mm -hmm. the autistic community, the, the Maori communities, and the healthcare sector. So we're talking about um, autistic healthcare professionals or uh, Maori healthcare professionals with autistic children. And, and there we're building very strong alliances and it's then via um, professional bodies in the healthcare sector or um, via um, representations of Maori cultures in this country that we can weave this weave ourselves into the discussion because that's where we can also pro contribute in a very valuable way because in all those intersections, we can uh, represent the, the voices of these highly marginalized autistic people. So yep. you can imagine how marginalized autistic clinicians are, right? You can imagine how marginalized Maori clinicians are. And we know how to advocate for, for these people from an independent perspective because, well, the, the, certainly the, the autistic healthcare professionals, they're nearly all undercover. Hardly any of them, any one of them can be out in the open, but we can, mm -hmm. they can connect with us anonymously and we can feed mm -hmm. back their concerns into, into their professional communities. 